Hello friends, welcome to my channel. In this video, I'll explain some of the most asked interview questions. So these questions are asked when you will go for interview for the post of QC engineer or when you will go for the interview of a third party inspector jobs. So let's start the video. Our first question is what is the primary purpose of a welding procedure specification? So welding procedure specification is also known as a WPS. WPS is the short form and the full form of WPS is welding procedure specification and this is one of the most common questions which are almost asked in every interview. So either they ask about the WPS, how the WPS is written or what are the contents of the WPS. So they ask this question in almost each and every interview about the WPS. So the answer will be let me read the options. Option A is to outline the qualifications of the welder. Option B is the to specify the welding process and variables. Option C is to determine the cost of the welding project and option D is to schedule welding activity. So friends option A is not true, option A is wrong to outline the qualifications of a welder. Option C is also wrong to determine the cost of the welding project cost is not determined by the WPS and option D is also wrong to schedule the welding activity. WPS is not meant for welding activity scheduling. See friends in WPS all the welding parameters which are to be used during welding is mentioned like the welding process and the different parameters. The different parameters like uh, you know base metal composition, uh, uh, filler metal variables details. Uh, current, voltage, pre-heat, post-heat, all these parameters are called as variables and the details of these variables are mentioned in the WPS. So the technical term of the welding parameters is the variables as per the WPS. So in WPS, it is a kind of a document. It's a document and in this document, all the details of the parameters. Parameters are technically known as variables. So the details of the variables are mentioned in the WPS. And what are the most common details or what are the most common variables which are mentioned in the WPS? See, it is often asked in the interviews, like what are the contents of the WPS? What are the variables which are mentioned in the WPS? So the main variables which are mentioned in WPS are the joint design. That is, it either it is single V or double V, it is U group, it is V group, like that these questions. Then base metals detail. In base metal detail, uh, the specification and grade of base metal, the P number of base metal, the G number of base metal, etc. are mentioned in the WPS. Then filler metal details, filler metal name, filler metal composition, not composition, filler metal F number, filler metal A number, etc. are mentioned. Then preheat temperature is mentioned in the WPS post weld, post heating and post weld heat treatment is mentioned in the WPS. Then the current range, range of the current, then voltage, then heat input. These are the variables which are mentioned in the WPS and it, it is often asked in interview. Now the variables like the joint design, base metal, preheat, post heat, current voltage are categorized as essential variables. Some variables are known as essential variables. Some variables are known as non-essential variables. And there are some variables which are called as supplementary essential variables. So these variables has been categorized in three main groups. One is essential variable, second one is non-essential and third one is supplementary essential variable. Now before proce proceeding further, I would request you to please join my channel. If you have subscribed my channel, then please join also. Please join my channel and this will encourage me to work more for you. Now question number two, what is the difference between essential and non-essential variables in the welding? So earlier in this question, I had explained that the variables are categorized in three main groups that is essential, non-essential and supplementary with essential. So in this question they are asking what is the difference between essential variable and non-essential variables. <laughs> so option A is essential variables are considered to affect the mechanical properties of the weld other than toughness properties while non-essential variables do not. Now this option is correct. 
I'll not read the other option. See what is the main difference between essential and non-essential variables. The essential variables are considered to affect the mechanical properties of the weld. Means all the variables which will affect the mechanical properties of the weld joint when it will be changed are called as essential variables. And the variables which do not affect the mechanical properties of the welding is called as non-essential variables. So what happens? Essential variables in welding is considered to affect the mechanical property and except one mechanical property, property that is toughness properties. So except toughness property, all other mechanical properties will be considered into essential variables. For toughness property, the supplementary essential variable comes into the picture. Now, since it affects the mechanical properties of the weldment, hence if any change you are going to do in the essential variables, then you need to requalify your WPS. And how your w, you requalify your WPS? You, you will have to requalify your WPS by conducting a procedure qualification test. Whereas in case of change in non-essential variable, you do not need to requalify the WPS, but you have to do the editorial revision. Only you have to revise the WPS. No need to conduct the procedure qualification test. Now question number three. What distinguishes an essential variable from a supplementary essential variable in a WPS? Now this is question about the difference between essential variable and supplementary essential variable. So as I told you earlier friends that essential variable is considered to affect the mechanical property other than toughness property and supplementary essential variable is ex exclusively when the toughness property come into the picture. So essential variables impact the mechanical properties of the joint while supplementary essential variable affect the toughness property. Friends here I want to make a disclaimer or I want to disclose one thing that this toughness property is also a mechanical property. Hence the answer, the correct answer should be like, you know, essential variable impact the mechanical properties of the joint other than except toughness properties while supplementary essential variable affect the toughness properties. Hence what will happen? See, the essential variables are considered to affect the mechanical properties other than toughness. <laughs> And supplementary essential variables affect the toughness property. Yes, the toughness is also a mechanical property. Hence, whenever supplementary essential variable is mandatory as per the construction code, then this supplementary essential variable also acts as an additional essential variable. Hence, if you will change your supplementary essential variable from the WPS, you will again need to requalify the WPS. See, in case of essential variable also, you, have, you will have to requalify the WPS in case of supplementary essential variables. Also, you will have to requalify the WPS. However, in case of non-essential variable, you do not need to requalify the WPS. Now, friends, again, I would uh, you know request you to please subscribe my channel. And after subscribing, you will see a join button by paying a very small amount. You can also join my channel. and this joining will encourage me to work more for you. Now, what does the term preheating refers to in welding? What is preheating? So preheating nothing but heating the job before, soon before welding. So let's see the options. Option A is heating the base metal before welding. Yes, preheating is heating the base metal or the job before welding. Now option B is Cooling the welded joint after completion. This is wrong. This is not cooling. Option C is applying heat to the filler metal. No, you apply heat to the base metal, not to the filler metal. So option B is also wrong. Option C is inspecting the weld visually. No, In preheating is not inspection. So option A is correct answer. C preheating refers to the weld to the process of heating the base metal before starting the weld. So before welding you need to heat the base metal if your WPS is uh, you know asked to do that. So when you heat that uh, base metal it is known as preheating. And why you do that? You do that because you need to slow down the cooling rate of the molten weld pool. So to slow down the cooling rate of the welded weld, molten weld pool you need to preheat the job. And not only that 
Preheating also reduces the risk of thermal stresses and distortion. So our next question, question number four. So question number four is asking what is the purpose of post weld heat treatment? So post weld heat treatment is also called as PWHT. Post weld heat treatment. This is very important. And many a times it is asked in the interview that what is the purpose of the post weld heat treatment? So the purpose of the post weld heat treatment is to relieve the residual stresses and improve toughness. See, main purpose is to relieve the residual stresses. What happens during welding? Stresses are generated in the weld joint. So those stresses needs to be relieved. Otherwise, failure will happen. So to relieve those stresses, PWHT is conducted. Post weld heat treatment is a process used to improve the mechanical properties of the weld joint. It involves see how it is done. You have to heat the welded joint to a specific temperature, then hold at that temperature for certain period. Then you cool that job. So by doing that, by doing the PWHT, the residual stresses are relieved. And if residual stresses will not be relieved, it can cause cracking and other defects in the welding. Hence, you need to relieve the residual stress. Friends, again, I would like to request you to please join my channel and subscribe my channel. Now, question number five. What is the difference between PWHT and post heat in welding? See friends, this question has been asked from me too. When I was attending an interview of CEIL, CEIL is a company, it is a sister concern of EIL and the interviewer had asked me, is PWHT and post heating same or it is different or what is the difference between PWHT and uh, post heating? So PWHT post weld heat treatment and post heat in welding. See what happens. PWHT is conducted to relieve the residual stresses which are generated during the welding and it is done after you know cooling of the weld. When the weld metal cools means after two three days or after uh, maybe five days also. So when the weld metal cools down then it is conducted soon after the cooling of the weld metal. Whereas post heating is done immediately after welding. As soon as you complete the welding, you start heating the job that is called as post heating and post weld heat treatment is done after cooling down of the weld metal. So the option, is, option A is the need for temperature monitoring. Option B is the timing of heat application. Option C is the type of joint compression com configuration. The option D is the impact of visual appearance. So as I told you, the timing of heat application is important. In post heating, the heating is done soon after the welding and in PWST, the heating is done after when the weld metal cools down. So post weld heat treatment that is PWHT involves heat treatment applied after weld after welding to relieve the residual stress and hence mechanical properties. On the other hand, post heat refers to heat applied immediately immediately after the welding. Now question number six. Which of the below mentioned non-destructive testing method can be used to detect surface breaking defects in weld which are not visible to the naked eye? So friends, to determine the surface defects, two tests means main test is dye penetrant test and the second test which can also determine the surface defects are magnetic particle test. See, dye, with dye penetrant test, you can detect only surface defects. Whereas with magnetic particle test, you can detect surface defect as well as subsurface defect. So our first priority will be dye penetrant test. But in the option, dye penetrant is not mentioned. But here in C, they have mentioned magnetic particle testing. Hence, the most appropriate answer will be magnetic particle testing. See, mean with magnetic particle test, you can detect the surface defect as well as the subsurface defects. So it is a non-destructive method. Now question number, we'll move to question number seven. Question number seven is what is the purpose of conducting a PMI that is positive material identification test. 
So many a time it is conducted at the site PMI and PMI is conducted to verify the chemical composition or to determine the chemical composition of the material. So PMI works on the principle of you know analytical technique. Uh, just a second, let me select the pen. So it is it works on the principle of X-ray fluorescence XRF or optical emission spectroscopy. So why it is beneficial because you do not need to damage the material without damaging the material without causing damage to material or without alteration on that material you will be able to determine the com composition of the elements present in that material now question number eight so question number eight is what does a material test certificate material test certificate is also known as mtc provide information about so in a mtc the chemical composition and the mechanical properties of the materials are mentioned. Not only this, the details of the material like heat number, mark number is also given. So basically it, it is used to, you know, check the chemical composition and mechanical properties of the material. So MTC provides essential information about raw materials including their chemical composition, mechanical properties and compliance with the industrial standard. Now question number nine. <laughs> So this question has never been asked, but I have written this question. What role does a TPI inspector, third party inspector play in the QC process? So the option C is the most appropriate answer provides an unbiased assessment. So T mostly companies hire TPI to give an impartial assessment of the job. Now question number 10. Question number 10, you have what does the material specification SF 516 grade 60 refers to. So option A is a type of stainless steel alloy. Option B is a specific grade of carbon steel for pressure vessel applications. Option C is an aluminium alloy commonly used in structural application. Option D is a high strength titanium alloy. So friends, I'll give you two second time. Please write the answer in the comment box. Okay, friends, the answer is B. SF516 grade 60 is a type of carbon steel and it is mostly, it is used in various industries, but it is used mostly or it is famous for pressure vessel manufacturing. So SF516 grade 60 is a carbon steel grade specifically designed for pressure vessel applications due to its excellent weldability and toughness properties, making it ideal for withstanding high pressure environment. Now friends, our question number 11 is how do SS304 and SS304L differ in the term of carbon content? See whenever you see a SS specification and if L is written, so L, you know, L says that this particular grade is having low carbon content. So option B is the correct one that is SS304 has a higher carbon content in uh, the content other as compared to SS304L. So L represents low carbon content, means SS304L is having less carbon content than SS304 or we can read vice versa like SS304 will have higher carbon content than SS304L. So friends, uh, with this we have come to an end of our today's video. Please write about the quality and contents of the videos and give your suggestions and feedback. Thank you very much.